Well, um, this is a seminar on drivers of environmental change. And the river environment is an interesting case study. Because water in rivers is a small residual from two large quantities that are important in Earth's environment, precipitation onto the surface of the Earth and evaporation from the surface of the Earth. Being a small quantity, uh, runoff is supposedly reasonably sensitive to changes in Earth's environment. So rivers are conduits to evacuate that difference from the surface of the land. And since water power can move Earth materials, rivers can influence their own morphology. And in the very long run, they determine the morphology of the terrestrial land surface by erosion, sediment transport, and deposition. River morphology also forms the geophysical basis of aquatic habitat. And so um, whatever happens to rivers will influence the ecosystems that depend upon them. And indeed, it's not simply aquatic habitat. Many terrestrial animals are obligate dwellers near water, and most terrestrial animals move along waterways and use waterways as um, a means for, um, or a route for travel as well as a route for foraging. Rivers are in a very real way the sort of the circulation system of the, the Earth's surface. Rivers are also readily affected by human activities, many of which are deliberately directed toward modifying um, the character of the river um, and the water in the river. Rivers in a landscape context um, are in part a consequence of climate and in part a consequence of geology and physiography. Climate creates runoff, that residual from precipitation minus evaporation, and that becomes stream flow. In the course of flowing over the land, streams, st streaming water picks up sediments which derive from the land surface, and what sediments are picked up depends on the condition of the land surface. That sediment transport then with the water moves down the river and together the water and the sediment determine the character of the river, whether it's a big wide shallow river with multiple channels, whether it's a river flowing um, in a single thread, whether it's got islands in it, whether it, it wanders about or flows in a relatively straight line. This depends on the interplay of, of water flows and, and the sediments, which collectively we can call fluvial processes, which lead of course to the, the riverine landforms. Now humans get into this act by making decisions about land use that determine what the condition of the land surface is. And so they can powerfully influence runoff and sediment transport. There's actually a connection missing in this diagram, which is a conventional diagram out of a textbook, and it's that connection. Humans, of course, directly manipulate rivers to take advantage of water resources. And in so doing, they can have a, an immense influence on the character of the river as, as well as the quality of the water. In the long term, of course, other things influence the land surface and with it rivers, including glaciations and ultimately tectonics and the relative level of the sea to which rivers are flowing. But those are long-term effects that I won't say much more about this evening. So the governing conditions that determine what a river looks like, how it behaves, are first of all the volume and temporal distribution of water that's delivered to the channel. How much water goes down the channel determines the size of the channel. Not exactly rocket science. Secondly, the volume and caliber of the sediment delivered to the channel. It matters whether the sediment is fine material that can be moved a long way in suspension or whether it's cobbles and boulders that fall to the bottom of the river and become part of the riverbed. The character of the sediments on the bed and banks of the channel and the condition of bank vegetation is also important. How able the banks are to resist the erosive forces of flowing water has a lot to do with the shape of the channel. Um, and so that's very important. And the topographic gradient down which the river flows, <coughs> the slope that's available, which determines how quickly the potential energy of the water is expended, um, is important. And of course that involves landscape history because the general declivity of the land surface will depend upon the history of uh, landscape. In cold climates, the ice regime is seasonally important in rivers and has some influence on river morphology. And finally, of course, human interference can be very important. 
Human interference, in fact, can directly affect the first three of those conditions I just talked about. It doesn't have much effect on the other two. But through this pathway, humans can have a significant influence on rivers. So we've got climate and we've got human influences at play in influencing um, the behavior of rivers um, in the short to intermediate term. The long term for rivers, of course, is geological uh, time scales, which um, can cover many millennia to um, hundreds of millennia. I'd like to give you a bit of background about drainage basins. As rivers, of course, flow in drainage basins with well-defined water divides, which divide one drainage basin from another. The upland parts of the drainage basin are the source of water and sediment, and that covers 80% of the drainage network. We don't think of these small upland streams very often, but in fact, they're by far the majority of the channel length of any river system. Upland channels are directly coupled to the adjacent hillside slope. That is, the adjacent hillsides come straight down to the river so that sediment that's mobilized on the hillsides is apt to end up in the river or stream. In comparison, the lower parts of rivers, the trunk streams that flow along the main valleys, um, are often separated from local hill slopes by sediment storage, um, which is sediment that's been brought down and deposited by the river itself in a floodplain. And so the downstream parts of a river system are often isolated from um, what is going on on the adjacent hillside slopes. Now, if we sort of think about a straight line through the drainage system, um, we can look at the way in which characteristics of the drainage system change as we move through it. We find water, of course, always tends to follow the line of steepest descent. And so channel gradient declines rapidly in the upstream part of the system and then steadily less rapidly as we get farther and farther down the system. Stream flow, on the other hand, increases steadily through the system for the obvious reason that as tributaries come together, the total amount of flow in the river is increasing. The product of the channel gradient and the flow is the power of the stream, the ability of the stream to do work. And at first, the increase of discharge on the high gradient causes stream power to increase from the headwaters, but eventually, gradient becomes more important than the increase in discharge and stream power begins to decline as you move into the distal parts of a system. So somewhere in the middle of the system, stream power, the ability to do work, um, is maximized in the river system. And that means that we have an important area in mid-system, sort of the, what I call the upland valley region, um, where rivers are apt to be most active and to do the greatest amount of work. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. There's some immediate consequences we can draw from this. First of all, the condition of coupled and up upland channels depends on water and sediment delivery from adjacent hill slopes. So the condition of the river channels really depends on land use on adjacent slopes or land condition on adjacent slopes and where people are working the land for agricultural activity, for forestry activity, for communication routes or for settlements, they can have a powerful influence on the character of the streams that drain those upland areas. In comparison, the condition of the valley streams, the main trunk valley streams, decoupled from adjacent hillside slopes, really depends on water and sediment delivery from upstream, from the upland. And therefore, direct human manipulation of water flow in the channel um, is the major factor, in, human factor, in influencing the condition of these trunk streams. And so that means that management activities to try and ameliorate conditions in drainage basins should be focused on land use in uplands and should be focused on the channel itself and the way in which it's used along trunk valley systems. A very simple lesson, uh, one that's not always recognized. Again, we have this sensitive mid-system air region. It's a critical zone because in the ecosystems that live in these rivers, there's reliance on primary production of carbonaceous material on the upland land surface and along the many kilometers of these upland channels. 
that carbonaceous material in the form of plant matter, um, benthic insect organisms, and other organic material moves down the system and into the lower river where there's often more living space and a wider variety of, of living organisms, particularly fishes. And so the connection from the upland to the lowland course of rivers is particularly important in the ecological system that a river maintains. But this critical area in the middle is exactly the area where we often build barrages. Because here, we've accumulated a good deal of water from the upland tributaries. We still have a considerable gradient. And this is an excellent area to control water for flood protection, for hydropower production, uh, for takeoff of water uh, by gravity feed to settlements farther down the system. That, of course, cuts the riverine ecosystem in half. Need to know one more thing about rivers before we start to look at these issues of climate and human use of rivers and river systems. Um, the form of a river channel scales with the flow that goes through the channel. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. The width, depth, and velocity of a river in particular scale with flow. Um, here we have a picture of channel width varying with river flow, the characteristic discharge of the river, which extends over more than three orders of magnitude. The biggest channels on here are more than 1,000 uh, times larger than the smallest channels shown on here. And the width of the channel changes accordingly uh, as the discharge changes. Uh, it varies over about an order and a half of magnitude here. And we can express this variation in a simple equation that says width is a function of the discharge raised to some power times some constant. The constant is influenced by material properties, and that's what this upper diagram shows. A channel with clay banks is apt to be narrower and relatively deeper than one with sandbanks, simply because the clay in the channel sides will resist erosion more effectively than sand would. Sand is non-cohesive, easily erodible, and so you'll get a wide, shallow channel versus a narrow, relatively deep one. And this power is, is relatively fixed, and for channel width, it varies at about the 0.5 power. So that equation um, fits that, is, is fitting, fitting that line. The coordinates are logarithmic. And and so we find we've got some simple relations to describe channel form as a consequence of flow. And I'll come back to that in a, in a little while. And remember that that number, 0.5. So on to the main issues. First of all, let's look at climate and its influence. This map shows trends in annual precipitation, essentially through the 20th century. And it's a rather spotty map, but what we can get from it is that in the, in the northern and southern temperate zones, there's been a general increase in precipitation over the 20th century. Um, here in our own region, um, precipitation has been increasing uh, really right through the 20th century. Oops, a daisy. I'm sorry. I thought there was another. I thought I was going to get a little circle in there to illustrate our region, but I guess it's not there. Um, in the subtropical regions of the world, we seem to have a drying trend. We also have greater precipitation, seemingly, in the monsoon regions of the world. That next slide that I just flashed is, in fact, expected precipitation trends through this present century. And this is, in fact, a map of a modeled projected precipitation for the years 2080 and 2099. The map is based on the so-called A1B scenario of the infamous IPCC. A1B is thought to be the most likely scenario. It's a scenario that expects population growth to about a maximum of 9 billion mid-century and then slight decline. It expects there to be fairly rapid development, particularly in developing countries, a ready uptake of new technologies, and by the late in the century, a mix of energy sources, including renewables, nuclear, and fossil fuels still. And that's thought to be the most likely trajectory of world socioeconomic development. And this reflects the precipitation consequences of the climate change that's expected to come with that. Um, blue is, uh, the blue tones are where precipitation is expected to increase. The bright tones are where precipitation is expected to decrease. And once again, the subtropics are going to get drier 
uh, the temperate and boreal and polar zones are expected to get wetter and this irritating stipple that overlies everything and makes it a bit obscure is a measure of the reliability. The map is produced from a consensus of I think it's 15 global climate models and, and the stipple is where more than about three quarters of them agree on what's going to happen at least as to trend. Now for our part of the world there's that little circle I was looking for up here it appears as though we're going to have about a 10% increase in precipitation through the 21st century. If 20th century experience is anything to go by that's probably a little bit conservative but it, it's going to be that order. Um, keep that number in mind as well, 10%. Precipitation intensity is also suspected, expected to increase. That's because a warmer atmosphere can carry more moisture. It can generate more vigorous convection. Um, and for those of you who have always lived in the sort of the boreal regions of the earth, go to the tropics sometime and find out what convection really can be like. Uh, because we haven't seen anything yet. Um, this map is, is frustratingly expressed in terms of standard deviations away from contemporary intensities and we're expected to increase in this region by perhaps um, one and a quarter standard deviations which is quite a big excursion um, in the future. But um, I can't put a number or a proportion on that. And this is the consequence. This is the expected runoff by late in this century, again according to the A1B scenario. And the pattern reflects pretty much the pattern of the preceding maps. Drying trends, severe drying trend around the Mediterranean through the subtropics and the coastal deserts. Um, more moisture in the temperate and polar zones. Um, I guess they did not quite know what to do about Antarctica so they conveniently left it off the map. Um, the white areas are regions in which there's no specific trend decidable on the basis of current modeling. And once again, the, the cross hatch is areas of high confidence. And our expected change up here is again on the order of about 10%. And that's a little bit surprising because um, not only will precipitation increase, apparently, by on the order of about 10%, um, but in a warmer atmosphere, we would expect evaporation to increase as well. I think the difference here is that factor of greater intensity. Because precipitation that arrives at the Earth's surface in high intensity storms tends to run off in greater proportions than light precipitation will do. And so the combination of an increase in precipitation, an increase in its intensity, and an increase in potential evaporation um, seems to add up to a, uh, a runoff change trend that so far as current modeling goes, and that's another caveat, models are far from perfect, so far as current modeling goes, um, suggests that the increment to runoff in the future will be similar to the increment uh, of precipitation in this part of the world. This is not true by any means everywhere. So the consequence, um, we would expect higher runoff in our rivers. How much higher relatively? Well, what is on your screen now is um, a diagram that shows magnitude and frequency of flood runoff in rivers in British Columbia. And it's based on two periods, a relatively dry period before 1947 in the early part of the 20th century. You know, the, all the tales about the dry, the droughty 30s, um, the windblown 30s, the dirty 30s. Um, and then the period from 1947 to 1979, which was a relatively wet period. Wonderful years if you were a skier in the BC mountains. And what you can see is that in characteristic flood magnitudes for given return periods, there's a dramatic difference between those two periods. Here for the Skeena River, um, an unregulated river in northern BC, we see for mean annual flood, a flow that recurs on average about once every 2.3 years, there's a 20% difference in the flow from the dry period to the wet period. For the Columbia River in eastern British Columbia, the headwaters of the Columbia, there's a 15% difference. And for Boundary Creek, a smaller drainage basin in the southern interior, the relatively dry southern interior, a 25% difference 
at mean annual flood level. Now these other two plots, the Quinell River and the Lillibut River, don't show anything like the same change. Quinell River runoff is controlled by a very large lake, one of the largest lakes in British Columbia, which immensely dampens changes. While the Lillibut River has glaciers in it, and so warm dry periods, runoff is made up by extra melt from the glaciers. So we've historically experienced runoff swings of a magnitude comparable with those that we can expect to see here in the future. So we don't expect any radical change in river behavior, I think, at least not in this part of the world. There are other parts of the world um, where that might not be true. Just for your interest, here's a somewhat more nuanced summary of runoff changes for British Columbia. Um, I expect that in small drainage basins, extreme flooding is going to become considerably more common. Uh, in the interior of British Columbia, summer floods resulting from uh, vigorous convective storms will produce higher runoff, whereas autumn floods on the coast may become um, more extreme as a result of um, simply increase in storm precipitation out of warmer skies. And winter flows will increase because a higher proportion of winter precipitation will be rain rather than snow. In medium-sized basins, high flows will increase and become more frequent with occasional unprecedented flows, particularly in the autumn. And this will be the consequence of vigorous cyclonic storm activity, often with embedded convectional squall lines in the fronts, the um, synoptic fronts. In large basins, which in this province are controlled by an annual snowmelt freshet, flood flows, I think, are going to decrease slightly on average. And that's counter to what um, the experts at the Institute for Climate Change will tell you. Um, but I suspect that that's going to be the consequence of higher snow lines and smaller winter snowpacks. But historic high flows might still occur in late spring after a winter with a relatively heavy snowpack if a major storm comes in on top of that snowpack, as happened in 1948 and again in 1972, we could still see flows as high as anything we've seen historically. And certainly winter flows will increase in these large drainage basins. Now what's the consequence of climate change for the river? Oh my, more mathematics. I'll bet you thought this was going to be entertaining rather than hard work. Um, from this simple equation, this, this, this scale equation for river channel size, which we introduced a few minutes ago, we can get to this statement, um, which is a differential statement. It says that the relative change in width, dw means change, and I'm using this symbol squiggly d to indicate other things being equal. For the mathematicians in the room, it's a partial derivative, of course. Um, the relative change in width is equal to that exponent b times the relative change in discharge. Now you get to that quite easily just by differentiating that with respect to discharge and then dividing the result by the original equation. That's how you derive that. So this says that the change in width is equal to some fraction of the change in the relative change in discharge. Now we've observed for the Pacific Northwest a predicted plus 10 percent change in runoff and I didn't emphasize it at the time, but that same map showed the maximum would be near plus 40 percent in Arctic regions. And since the factor here is one half, there's our 0.5, that suggests 5 percent change in river channel width. The scaling will produce a 5 percent change here, and perhaps 20 percent change in stream channel width in the Arctic as a gross average, not dramatic. Now, I should say something about the comparisons I've just made. There's some, there's some slips in the argument here. Um, it's supposed that this, this channel width is set by some relatively high flow, something like the flood flows we were looking at on that change in flood flow diagram a minute or two ago. On the other hand, the runoff map from which we got this 5% is a map of the mean annual runoff, not of flood flows. It doesn't say anything about flood flows. We don't know enough about how much precipitation intensities will increase to project flood flows very accurately. So there is a slip here, um, but it's the best we can do at the moment with the information to hand. 
Land and water use, human actions. Well, in comparison with what we've just been talking about, I think these are the elephants. Agricultural land use is the dominant cause of soil erosion globally, the dominant cause of the contribution of sediments into rivers. A portion of eroded sediments enters water courses and that affects water quality and it also affects the river habit. By habit I mean once again whether it's wide and shallow, whether it has islands or not, whether it's wiggly or runs relatively straight, whether it's actively eroding its banks or whether it is relatively stable in its channel position. Most regional sediment yield graphs look something like this. This is a, a graph with quite scattered data from the eastern Canadian prairies. What this says is that in small drainage basins, the sediment yield per unit area is relatively high. As we go down the system, the yield per unit area averaged over the area becomes smaller. Now that implies one of two things. It either means that we're systematically getting less sediment from the land surface as we go to larger and larger basins. There's no obvious reason why that should commonly be the case. Or it means that we're losing some of the sediment that's initially entrained up here into deposits along the stream channels, deposits in floodplains. This is a common pattern worldwide where there's significant disturbance to the land surface, substantial amounts of sediment are mobilized, much of what is mobilized is then lost to valley sediment deposits, to floodplain construction, to the aggradation of the river, meaning the river is slowly raising its bed as it deposits sediment. Wild landscapes, on the other hand, in Canada look like this. This is the western South Saskatchewan system. And this says there's relatively little sediment coming off the land surface near the headwaters. And there's more sediment per unit area apparently further down the system. Now that means one of two things. It either means that we're systematically getting more sediment from the land surface as we move down the system. Again, that seems a bit unlikely as a generality. Or it means the sediment is being picked up from right along the riverbanks themselves. And the river is engaged in picking up sediment and degrading its bed, lowering its bed over a long period of time. And that's what's happening in most wildland rivers in Canada where the rivers are still evacuating sediments that are derived from the last glaciation. It's interesting that many geomorphologists in the world, because this pattern is so common, think that that is the only possible pattern. And Professor Slaymaker and I discovered this about 25 years ago, and we've, we've written papers about it, but I don't think many people have picked up the point even yet. Uh, nobody pays any attention, we Canadians. Little, we're little people in the attic of the world. If we had a landscape that was actually in equilibrium, its sediment yield graph would look like that. It would be essentially the same everywhere across the landscape. And such landscapes do exist um, within Canada, notably in southern Ontario, actually. Well, here's a couple of maps that are a consequence of that way of looking at sediment yield of rivers. This is a map which shows sediment yield scaled to one square kilometer. That's a map derived from individual graphs using the data from the extreme left-hand side of the graph, the data from here. The other map is using data from over here. And here's this eastern prairie situation where we see we've got the blue shades, relatively low sediment yields at the local scale. Um, sorry, the east, I'm, mistaking there. For the eastern prairies, these yellow shades. And then when we go to the larger range basin area, it regresses into the blue shades, indicating declining specific yields as you go down the system. Whereas in most other places in the country, we're going forward from, say, yellow into the orange or red, which is higher yields, as we go to the larger drainage basins. And in particular here in the mountains, we've got huge area of very low sediment yield at the local scale. But by the time we get to larger scales, we're seeing much increased yields in much of the area. So humans can have a big impact on the system in as much as this is a characteristic signature of sediment yield to stream systems in human impacted landscapes, whereas these are characteristic signatures in wild landscapes.
In fact, agriculture mobilizes as much as two orders of magnitude, that's 100 times, more soil than does natural erosion. This plot, due to our colleague David Montgomery at the University of Washington, accumulates all the available studies of aerial erosion on the surface of the earth for wild lands, which are supposed to reflect the underlying geologically determined or climatic geologically determined rate of erosion of the land. And this represents agricultural landscapes. And the difference is just about two orders of magnitude across most of this realm. The third plot on here is the rate at which soil is being produced by rock weathering. And so what you see is that at least roughly, realizing these are sample studies, they're by no means a universal plot, soil production approximately equals the rate of wildland erosion. Whereas human disturbance dramatically increases the erosion rate, dramatically increases the loss of soil from hill slopes into river valleys and ultimately onward to lakes and the sea. Turning from land use to the direct use of water by humans, Damming of rivers is perhaps the most dramatic change in river character and habitat that humans create. Rivers are dammed for a whole range of reasons, including water supply, flood protection, hydropower, and also to facilitate navigation and recreation in some places. But most of the world's largest dams are hydropower dams. This set of diagrams illustrates the impact of flow regulation at dams. And this is the impact of the Bennett and Peace Canyon dams on Peace River in northern, northeastern British Columbia and Alberta. This is the natural regime of the river before the dams were established. And it represents the hydrographs for one year, 1967, the last year before the dams were established, um, for individual stations down the system. The bottom solid line is Hudson's Hope, which is immediately below the dams. And the next lines are for Taylor, Peace Town of Peace River, and the top line is Peace Point, which is 1,200 kilometers downstream at the lower end of the Peace River system. And that's the natural regime, dominated by a snowmelt freshet in spring and early summer, snowmelt from the mountains, and then by a sort of a storm peak in autumn before everything freezes up and becomes snow for the winter. Here is a characteristic year after regulation. What we see is that at Hudson's Hope, the hydrograph is actually inverted with the highest flows now in winter and the lowest flows in summer. Because in winter, there's high demand for hydro and high generation. And in summer, there's low demand and the reservoir is being refilled using the snowmelt. Once we get down below the first significant tributary, there is a very modest freshet reestablished but it's only after we get below the dominant tributary, the Smoky River in Alberta, that a significant fresh occurs. But really, it's a small freshet compared to that. And then the highest flows are later summer storms that do produce, can produce relatively high flows, but of very short duration. And certainly not in every year. There's a year in which there's no notable major storm event at all. So in sum, the dams attenuate or invert the flow regime, and that may have major consequences for stream biota, particularly those whose life cycle is governed by the strength of the flows and where they can go in the river at particular times of year. Dams also reduce the duration of high flows and, in general, the magnitude of high flows. And this has major consequences for sedimentation and river channel morphology since it means the river will not have anything like the same sediment transporting capacity that it had before regulation. Just to carry this forward one more step, using that same equation and comparable equations for depths and velocities uh, that we looked at before, um, here's the ratio of mean annual flood in the regulated regime to that before regulation. In the upper part of the river, there's only about 40% um, 
of the water flow there was before during flood conditions. In the lower part of the basin, it's about 60%. And that means in the upper basin, the new equilibrium width of the river will be about 70% of what it was before. In the lower river, close to 80%. Depths and velocities have smaller exponents, and so they're not so strongly affected. Depths will be 80 to 85% what they were before. Velocities will be about 90 to 94 or 5% what they were before. And this last variable is the dominant pool spacing along the river, and it'll be about 80% of what it was before. So a smaller river and a simpler river with fewer side channels, um, fewer um, sloughs that are seasonally flooded than there were before, uh, a new lower floodplain that was formerly seasonally flooded bar surfaces, a quite different river than existed before. Here is a real catastrophe in the making. This is the Mekong River, which rises in China and then flows through uh, Laos, where for a long distance it forms the border with Thailand, then into Cambodia, past Ton Le Sap, the major lake, and then finally the delta in Vietnam. This river has got one of the richest, if not absolutely the richest, aquatic ecosystem in the world with a large variety of freshwater fishes, including the largest freshwater fishes in the world, giant catfish, giant freshwater rays. Chinese are currently constructing a series of eight power dams in their portion of the river. That will reduce the peak flows in the lower portions of the river. That will restrict the capacity of these fishes to move from seasonal feeding and loafing grounds to spawning grounds. It threatens the viability of this incredibly rich aquatic ecosystem and threatens the survival of several of the iconic species in this river. Here's another. This is the plan for development which is currently being put into effect for essentially all of the major rivers of South Korea. They're all going to simply become cascades of pools and, and outfall through dams uh, ending at tidal barrages at the lower part of the river. The desperate need of the country for power is driving this, um, but it's being bought at the destruction of the riverine ecosystems uh, that exist in this country. This is a map due to Christian Nilsson and his colleagues, a Swedish and ecologist, um, of the world's rivers with flow regulated by dams. Red indicates major regulation. Um, yellow indicates moderate regulation. Green indicates substantially unregulated, minor to unregulated. Um, and the uh, white indicates no major rivers. What you can see is that a remarkable proportion of the world's rivers are regulated in major or moderate degree. I do have some quibbles um, on the map. Um, the Fraser Basin is shown as moderately regulated. It, there's one diversion and one dammed tributary on the Fraser system. I would think that's still fairly minor, is the big river. So I'm, I'm not sure how they've arrived in detail at, at their decision to classify. These circles, um, indicate, again, major, moderate, and minor regulation by number of river systems, by total water volume on an annual basis, and by drainage area. And you can see that in every case, except number of systems, um, the, no the amount of unregulated river that's left is small. What is left is largely located in northern Canada, Alaska, and the northern, in northern Russia in the far boreal regions of the world and smaller areas in the developing but erstwhile not highly developed tropics. So the world's rivers are already largely compromised through flow and sediment transfer changes um, by human activity. We do other things to rivers than and damn them. We also attempt to train rivers. River training refers to sort of trying to control the river to, so that it has a, a particular morphology. Straightening the river uh, for navigation purposes, 
or for convenient access to property on either side, dredging the river to facilitate navigation. Here's a consequence of local river training in the form of dredging the port of Vancouver, uh, the Fraser Port, part of the port of Vancouver. The Fraser River, as far upstream as Port Man, is a deep sea navigation waterway, but it's a deep sea navigation waterway by virtue of continuous dredging. What that has done is to lower the bed of the river, and that in turn has lowered the water surface by as much as about 25 centimeters at Port Man at a flow level of about 10,000 cumex, and by about a half a meter at a flow level of 18,000 cumex. Well, that sounds good. That sounds like we're buying flood protection at the same time as we're dredging the river. But the lowering of the bed here will propagate upstream all the way to Mission on a time scale of more than a century. By our dredging in the latter part of the 20th century in the Fraser Port, we've set in train changes in Fraser River that will be going on for more than a century. And as it progresses upriver, it may destabilize banks, it may expose outfalls or cause troubles for water intakes, it may affect bridge foundations. We, we don't know all the impacts that it will have. But what this does indicate is that changes in one part of a river, because of issues like sediment transfer and so on, can be telegraphed along the river considerable distance, but over a considerable length of time. And so actions taken in the short run can have long-term consequences, consequences that future generations will have to wrestle with. Rivers are also a source of resources, in particular, aggregate materials. Aggregate materials, gravel, sand, um, are unsung materials in the mineral industry, but they're absolutely essential as an underpinning of civilization. These materials are the basis for concrete from which we build our structures. They're the basis for prepared roadbeds for communication routes. They're the basis for landfill materials to regrade topography so that we can build on the topography. They're by far the largest um, element in the mineral industry by volume. But they are cheap, therefore they can't be brought from far away. Nobody likes to live next to a gravel pit. And in much of the world, gravel is not abundantly available in any case. And so one increasingly looks to things like rivers uh, to find sources of aggregate materials. And naively, um, construction specialists and others think that, well, gravel in a river is a renewable resource. For after all, we take the gravel out of the river and the river brings more gravel down. But taking that resource can degrade riverbed locally and it certainly destroys the aquatic habitat. It may also change the habit of the river. A river that formerly flowed around islands and had back channels and side channels may, if sufficient aggregate is removed, be reduced to flowing in what amounts to a ditch. And you'll still have an ecosystem there, but it'll be dramatically different than the original ecosystem because of the dramatic change in river conditions. I'll finish up this talk with a further example of that issue. Water supply is, is another issue that is, has really become a mega problem. Most of or all of you, I'm sure, are aware that fresh water supplies are at a critical pass in much of the world. Here in the southwestern United States, the Colorado River has been dammed um, for hydropower, the upper dams, for water supply in the lower dams along the river. And today, nearly all of the flow is diverted for domestic or irrigation use within the United States so that relatively little water in the Colorado River reaches Mexico or the Gulf of California. The most dramatic changes this has produced have been in the character of the Gulf of California, which has become more salty, and that in turn has led to wholesale changes in the ecosystem in this waterway, with wholesale changes in the fishing industry upon which the people in the coastal villages along the Gulf of California um, rely. The Indus River of Pakistan and some of the tributaries flow out of India. Here dams and water transfers um, serve to create hydropower and for irrigation 
Irrigation is so important, particularly in the Pakistan breadbasket of Sindh province, that almost no water today reaches the Arabian Sea. And that's led to the destruction of coastal mangroves, which has exposed this coast to storm-driven erosion in a manner that it was not previously exposed. This area is interesting, incidentally, because it's that part of the world. The, the engineering here for these, this system of barrages and flow diversions from one river to another began in the late 19th century uh, when the British ruled uh, peninsular India. And it was in this area that those little equations, the width is a, is a simple function of discharge, were first developed. So this area is not only a major water supply problem area today, but it's a historically very, very important region for development of the understanding of how rivers behave or how they should be allowed to behave. China. I think everyone is aware that China is critically short of water resources, particularly this region in northern China here, where there's a very large concentration of population and also which is the wheat breadbasket of China. In fact, most of you are probably aware that China is suffering a major drought today uh, in this region. All the rivers that cross the plain here are essentially entirely taken up uh, for uh, domestic or industrial water use and irrigation. Um, traveling on the highways up the coast here as you cross these rivers, the channels are all dry and there's no sign that there's been flow in them for some or considerable flow in them for some years. Even the great Huanghe, the Yellow River, barely reaches the sea in mid to late summer today. And so there's a grand plan to transfer water from the more abundantly watered south, um, Changjiang, the Yangtze River, and to the south of that, the Pearl River, perhaps one day. There's a plan to move water to the north in large quantities. And parts of the eastern and middle systems are already under construction in China. This, will, this amounts to plumbing on a continental scale. Humans have become continental plumbers. And it will buy water resources. Um, quality is another, the quality of the water is another question, but it will certainly destroy uh, remarkably rich aquatic ecosystems in these warm temperate to subtropical rivers. As a matter of fact, irrigation consumes a very large proportion, 75 or 80 percent of water that is diverted from rivers worldwide. And the key areas are in southwestern North America, in the Indian subcontinent, and in the Far East. These are areas which either have very high contemporary populations or very rapid population growth. They're areas where the issue of water supply for human, direct human consumption um, is itself in direct conflict with water needs for irrigation. And so one is building major problems here because the irrigation water is necessary for food supply. The water itself is necessary to support the human population in these areas. Um, and the fact of the population is, is at the base of the strain and the conflict within, within how to use the water resources. Um, but either way, um, the rivers um, are the source of the water and the source of major changes. There's another region in the world with major developing water resource problems, um, which doesn't have the luxury of the big rivers that there are in these other areas. That, those, those areas are the Mediterranean and the Middle East. To shift the topic to some degree, um, the question of restoring rivers has recently become a fashionable project in the wealthy West. I think river restoration actually has less to do with recovering some pristine state, which we don't know what it was in any case, than has got to do with imposing a cultural or eco-cultural vision upon waterways. I say eco-cultural because the, the mantra for restoring rivers, at least in this part of the world, is restoring the ecosystem, bringing back the salmon. I don't think most people would be very happy if we actually did restore these rivers because amongst other things we'd be reestablishing frequent flooding and we'd be reestablishing sort of lateral erosion and general instability and the consumption of people's property. People like to live on riverfronts so long as they're quite certain the river isn't going to sort of move over and take their house away. 
but you can't guarantee that if the river is a natural river. The project makes practical sense in those downstream reaches I spoke about, those uncoupled reaches, where development commonly has changed the character of the river in a dramatic way, but by the same token, it precludes real restoration. Uh, ten days ago, I was in Alberta discussing the Peace River with the Alberta Department of Environment. They've suddenly decided they want to restore the Lower Peace River from the effects of the Bennett and Peace Canyon dams. And I haven't a blind clue how they're going to do this, given the regulated flow regime, <laughs> which the dams aren't going to go away. So, um, What they can do is they can do local enhancements that, that might influence ecosystem vigor and ecosystem diversity locally along the river. And it does make sense to talk about those things. Direct interference with rivers, direct river training began seriously in the mid 18th century in Europe. And a very high proportion of all Western European rivers are today trained or canalized to one extent or another. Having woken up to the impacts of this, Europeans are busy trying to reattach abandoned meanders, abandoned river bends that were cut off. Anything they can do to reestablish local wetland areas or local flooded areas that can serve as sort of pocket aquatic ecosystems, if you like. And I think in many cases that's the best we can do. I want to end this talk by talking about the complexity that underlies issues of river management. And I'm going to return once again to the local region, partly because I know it best. Um, the example of Lower Fraser River. The Fraser is a big river. It's also a mountain river. It flows out of its canyons near Hope and turns into the lower mainland. It brings cobbles and gravels and sands, and silt and clay, down through the canyons. And when it turns into the lower mainland, the slope declines as the river approaches the sea. The river can no longer push the gravels farther on. And so the gravels are deposited in a reach of some 75 or 80 kilometers from west of Hope to about Sumas Mountain, just east of the city of Mission. This, this reach here. Here we are on Point Grey in Vancouver. And since the gravel is deposited there, the riverbed is a grading. This plot is a kilometer by kilometer plot of the amount of river aggradation, measured as volume, as volume rather than height, um, that has occurred in the, lat in the second half of the 20th century. We derive that plot from repeated surveys of the river. And what you see is that there's been, um, these are thousands of cubic meters, so there's been as much as a million cubic meters of material deposited in some kilometer length reaches of the river. There's also been net loss in some other reaches. But overall, there's much more sediment deposited than has been lost. So the riverbed is a grading. Uh, the black parts of the spikes, incidentally, indicate gravel that's been removed from the river by gravel mining, and which isn't actually there anymore. So the actual aggradation is less than the appearance. But this is worrying, because if the bed is rising, so is the water surface for any given flow. And if the water surface is rising, it means the dikes along the river provide less protection against floods than they were designed to do. And that's a problem, particularly for the people who live out there in uh, Chilliwack and Abbotsford and Mission, places like that. So there's one of several things you can do about this. One of the things you can do is build the dikes higher. But that's expensive, and you can't build them infinitely high. Another thing you can do <coughs> is take institutional measures like strict land zoning, no build zones, have emergency evacuation plans, have flood insurance. That's generally not socially acceptable. People want absolute protection. So the third thing you can do is take gravel out of the river. And so we're back to gravel mining. The problem is that reach of the river sustains one of the richest freshwater fisheries in the world. There are 28 species of fish in that part of the river, uh, native fish, uh, six very important salmonid species, 11 or 12 salmonines. Uh, a couple of iconic threatened species, that's the northern white sturgeon. That's, that's a tiny one, a small one. Those fish grow to be about three meters plus in length and live about 150 years. Salmons, 
and then some of the smaller denizens of the river. I guess nobody would be worried too much about sculpins, but they're an important part of the ecosystem. And the fishery depends upon the gravel. Fish are relatively small creatures. Fish tend to focus on specific little features of the river, mostly near the banks. There's, there's no point living in the, in the middle of a river. That's like living in the Sahara Desert in a sandstorm. Um, so these are the kinds of places where fish are found. And these places are created and recreated by the movement and deposition of gravel. And as we take gravel out of the river, we eliminate that continual movement and resorting of gravel down the river. And so we lose these sorts of places, we simplify the environment, and different fish will survive there than have survived there before. Many of the fish that are there now won't survive a change of that sort if the gravel mining is carried on extensively. In most places in the world where gravel mining is carried on, they haven't bothered to sort of establish a sediment budget like that before they've thought about mining. They've simply assumed that there's a huge amount of gravel available in the river. I mean, after all, it seems to be a huge amount, but it's taken 10,000 years to accumulate it. Gravel is taken out wholesale, and the river collapses into a ditch. And that's happened time and again in many places in the world. So the question arises, is it a sound policy to remove gravel from the river? Now, in current research, we're just coming upon a, an additional realization. When I saw that gravel budget, I asked myself, well, where did the gravel come from? And it's beginning to appear that a lot of this gravel actually was put into the upper river in the 19th century by gold miners, people again. And if that's the case, there's no gold mining going, up, going on up there today. The big highway and railway projects, which probably also dumped quite a lot of gravel into the river, they're long finished. So this gravel supply may not be sustained. So if we merrily take gravel out of the river and it's not replaced, we certainly will threaten the fishery. On the other hand, if that's not right, if there is a continuing gravel supply to sustain the level of the river, we should probably remove an amount that's at least approximately equal to what is coming in over a period of years. And if we don't, um, not mining could threaten the security against flooding of the entire Lower Mainland. And a major flood in the Lower Mainland would probably be more than the Canadian Treasury could bear. In the background, of course, climate change and changing uses of the river presage other changes at the same time. So we have to manage this problem in the light of all these uncertainties. And that is not unusual in river management issues around the world. And that's why river, river management is a tolerably difficult issue. Well, thanks very much for your attention and interest. Huh? Mike, you didn't say anything about the local urban river. If we have an increase in intensity, an increase in precipitation, and an increase in per impervious surfaces, what's the prognosis and what can we do about it? Um, ur urban rivers are characteristically very highly disturbed be because never mind climate change, the increase in impervious surface produces runoff that comes faster and in larger proportions of the total precipitation input. Consequently, you increase flood peak flows dramatically. And that usually leads to significant degradation because another thing that the urban surface does is it usually cuts off the supplies of the coarser material that would form the bed and banks of the river. There may be a lot of fine material and pollutants going down an urban stream channel but usually not too much in, in the way of coarse materials. So you usually get wholesale degradation. That can under, undermine the foundations of adjacent structures and things like that. It's not unusual. Um, what may happen in the future is simply an um, intensification of that. There are, of course, ways that you can um, try to mitigate those effects, such as putting concrete steps or mini barrages in the channel, that is, local base levels, to prevent it the river degrading. What you'll usually end up with, however, is, is a, 
essentially a glorified ditch, by which I mean a sort of a, a, a channel way with a, a much impoverished ecosystem in it because of these dramatic flushing flows. And conversely, in dry times, um, an absence of base flow because there hasn't been the same groundwater recharge with the large amount of impervious surface and the immediate runoff of water. So you, you usually are turning these things into extensions of the sewer system is what this amounts to. Oh, with climate change, uh, those effects may be further um, exacerbated. Yes, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I have a question. I would like to get your opinion on uh, it seems a uh, rapidly developing uh, uh, rapid development of uh, independent power projects in BC. Uh, it seems to uh, be picking up the pace and there's a lot of, uh, especially on the, those huge projects, uh, the mega projects like the uh, inlet projects that are in France. You know, what, what do you think? How, you know, very often these, these round of river projects are labeled as a dream. And I'd like to <laughs> hear what you think about this. Well, I don't think they're particularly green at all. Um, my major concern with these projects, however, is not related to the siting of the project or the project site. They're often fairly carefully chosen so that they're well above the, that point in the river where there's significant fisheries. They don't interrupt in quite the same way that a big dam with a major reservoir does, the downstream flow of carbonaceous material. What these projects do do, however, is they're opening up a tremendous amount of wild country by the establishment of access roads and power lines. And that's potentially trashing a lot of our remaining wilderness. Um, big animals and ecosystems that have big animals in them need substantial undisturbed areas. And by cutting the undisturbed area up by, with access roads and, and power lines, I think substantial ecological damage is being done. Another way of putting that question is to ask, well, faced with independent power projects or a, a major project such as British Columbia Hydro's projected development of another dam on Peace River, which is better? And my answer is, well, hydropower is a Faustian bargain, but the least bad bargain is the big project on Peace River because it's already a, a developed river and um, it, will, it will focus the development at one point. The power line rights of way are already in place. It makes more sense to develop that river than to be herring all over the coastal wilderness. But do you think that if we have those mega projects, like the game that we have to do, I think 17 different streams are supposed mm -hmm. to be diverted. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about the cumulative effect of these at watershed scale, can that influence to some substantial, you know, not like sediment dynamics, you know? Uh, well, diversion is another issue. Um, I wasn't thinking about diversion when I gave my answer. To the extent that you're diverting water, you're going to be changing conditions downstream in the streams from which water is taken out. And then ultimately, you've got some drainage channel way somewhere which has got a big increase in flow. So you'll change the character of that river too. Um, it's possible that um, increasing the flow in the receiving river might actually given that there's, there's not big storage, so the annual pattern of flow is not dramatically changed, you might actually, in the long run, enhance ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem diversity in that receiving water. But as against that, you'll have to um, balance off what is going on in all the rivers from which diversions have been taken and which have lower flows. <laughs> 